Today, we are chatting with Dr. Stephanie Ortiz Page. And Dr. Stephanie is a born and raised New Yorker who currently practices obesity and diabetes medicine. She's helped hundreds of patients lose weight and improve or reverse their diabetes and metabolic syndrome. She's now a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and the medical director for a metabolic weight loss program in Western Connecticut. She is passionate about preventing chronic disease by promoting a healthy lifestyle of nutrition and self care. We are so excited to have Dr. Stephanie. Stephanie chatting with us today and we hope you enjoy. Hi. Hi. How are you? I am good. How are you? So happy to see you. This is Tina. Hi, Hi Tina. Nice it's to meet you. So nice to meet you. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Okay. So Stephanie, what does it mean to be metabolically healthy? What does that term actually mean? All right. So metabolic health, it's like kind of a loaded two word term, right? What is it? And it's and it's come into light a lot more, especially in the last year and a half, year and a half plus with COVID and it being, it affecting um, more people that are not metabolically healthy. And this is where weight and obesity has really come into shedding a lot more light for everybody. So being metabolically healthy essentially means being free of metabolic disease. So those are things like prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, fatty liver disease, heart disease. And it really comes down to a real cellular level, right? When we are talking about general health. And it's looking outside of what your skill is reading or what size pants you wear, but really what's going on inside. How is our body maintaining homeostasis? So homeostasis means keeping things at a steady state. Our body likes to keep things always at a steady state. And when things are not at a steady state, that's where maybe you have some inflammation or you're not feeling well, or maybe you have a fever or you're having some joint pain, right? Maybe something's a little bit altered or your GI, you know, maybe you're having some bowel issues, right? So it means that there's some kind of imbalance. So our body's always trying to maintain balance in constant normal levels of water, for instance. Our electrolytes always want to stay within the same range. So those are like your sodium, your potassium or magnesium levels, our hormone levels like insulin, growth hormone, cortisol, which is our stress hormone. And when one pathway is altered, that's where diseases like type 2 diabetes can can happen. And risk factors for metabolic disease or to not be metabolically healthy is if your blood sugars are elevated, if you're sh kind of showing elevated, we call elevated fasting blood sugars. So if those are ranging above 100, if your triglycerides are high, so hot, which means our fatty acids in our body, are they greater than 150? Are your good cholesterol levels low? So that's your HDL. Um, is your blood pressure elevated? So, you know, that's considered when it's above 130 over 80 consistently. And also where are you carrying? your weight. Waist circumference is a big risk factor also for metabolic disease. Are you carrying more fat in your belly area? I can already tell this is an episode where we're all going to want to take notes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pull so, out your notepad. Yeah. Get your notepad <laughs> out. <laughs> Okay, so I also want to know when you were training, did you notice that there were some things missing with how doctors are treating patients who struggle with their weight, who struggle with metabolic disease? Definitely. I mean, so I trained actually in a very busy diverse inner city. I trained at Jamaica Hospital in Queens. So I saw a fairly sick patient population. And I think I had really strong training. I trained in family medicine. I did primary care. So I did a lot of inpatient, outpatient um, practice. And one of the things I, I actually did my research in obesity, medicine, in obesity during my uh, residency training. But after leaving training and going and practicing on my own, I felt like I still wasn't prepared, you know, to talk to patients about their weight to, you know, we were always treating, okay, let's treat the high blood pressure. Let's treat the diabetes. But we weren't always so quick to, you know, asking patients, why is this happening? You know, let's talk about your nutrition. Let's talk about your lifestyle, what's going on at home. So in training, but more so after training is where I realized where there was like a really big gap you know, and, and there was also no time, you know, we're seeing patients in a 10 to 15 minute time slot. And there was no time to really going to get down into the nitty gritty of what's going on at home. It was just easy to just, let me just start keep prescribing you medications for your diabetes and your blood pressure, but not finding out what's really going on. And I feel like there's such a, an idea of like somebody who might be carrying more weight goes into the doctor's office for 10 to 15 minutes for their consultation. And the first thing is like, well, you need to lose weight. And it has nothing to do with any of those other 
symptoms right. that they're describing. So when you're working with your your patients, how do you define a healthy weight? It's a good question. And I get that a lot. You know, patients ask me, but then I ask them, really, I return the question to them, you know, where do you want to be? Where do you feel the most healthy at? And healthy weight is so, indivi- is so individualized, right? There's a BMI scale. So BMI is a body mass index scale. And, if, you know, it takes into consideration your weight and your height and sometimes even your gender. And how do you um, feel about the BMI scale? I use it. I have a chart in my in my room and it's a way to classify, right? So if it's a BMI from 25 to 29, and we're going to classify as overweight. They're above 30, we're already in the obesity range. However, I don't like to dwell on that. It's more of a classification st- stage to to diagnose, right? To see, okay, maybe there's some risks here. But for a healthy weight, it really comes down to where do you feel the best? What weight are you don't have any risk factors, right? So at what weight do you have normal blood sugars? Is your blood pressure controlled? You know, is it going to be at that 25, quote unquote, BMI, or maybe 27 is the right weight for you, or 28 is the right weight for you for you to be able to maintain. The other reason why I don't love the BMI scale is because it doesn't take into consideration your muscle mass. Somebody can be 5'3 and 140 pounds and be considered in the overweight range, let's call that, but you know their waist circumference is down, they're carrying higher body mass, uh, muscle mass. The weights, the scale is going to read a little bit higher, right? So it doesn't take into consideration um, those factors. So I don't, I don't, I use it to classify, but I don't use it as targets for my patients in terms of identifying what their healthy weight is. That's a really excellent way to, to put that. Like, don't live and die by that chart. Take it with a grain of salt, but you can also use yes. it as some sort of measurement for tracking purposes. Yes, gotcha. but um, actually, in my clinic, you know, we do check weights at every visit, but we also do measurements because. A lot of times patients will come in, the weight maybe is down a pound or half a pound, but they've lost an inch from their waist or an inch from their hips. And honestly, to me, that matters more than what the scale is reading. And I tell patients that every single time they come in. What does the term weight bias mean? Because I've heard you talk about this and it is really interesting to me. And I kind of want you to walk us through it. Yeah, absolutely. So weight bias, this is very, it's a, actually a very big issue in all industries, as you probably know, yes. but it's having a negative attitude, stereotype, or judgment towards somebody, towards an individual because of their weight. It could be something that's very overt, or it can be something that's very subtle. And you can see it in every industry, you see it in education, you see it in the arts and theater industry, you see it in the corporate world. It could be even from buying a car or getting into a plane, right? You can experience some type of bias because of your weight there. And you can see it even unfortunately within your family and friends and in healthcare. And healthcare is probably the biggest place that we see it and the biggest issue, right? Because patients are sometimes not going in to get treated for their weight or they're scared to go in to go in for their routine screenings because they're fearful of their doctors judging them or they have been judged, right? You mentioned something earlier about a patient that's carrying extra weight. They come in and the doctor automatically assumes it's because of your weight. Your belly pain is because of your weight. And then a lot of things sometimes can get missed, right? So we there's higher rates of cancer, there's higher rates of heart disease, there's higher rates of metabolic disease in patients with obesity because yes, you are, you do have potentially have more risk factors, but I think a lot of it has to do with patients not going in and getting screenings because of the, this uh, weight bias. I mean, I feel like there's such a misconception too for people living in larger bodies that they might not have eating disorders or might have might not have body dysmorphia or we only associate, you know, not eating or or not nourishing ourselves with people living in smaller bodies, which I don't think is the case. And can I mean, can you be overweight and undernourished? Absolutely. And what does that look like? Absolutely. And I see that all the time. I mean, and there's also people that are normal weight. There's actually a lot of people that are normal weight and mm-hmm. undernourished as well, but carrying extra weight and not eating the right foods, under eating, you know, um, eating very low calorie diets and not losing weight, eating highly processed foods, you know, even at a small amount certainly can be undernourishing the quality of the foods also that you're eating, you know, certainly can be undernourished even when carrying um, extra weight. And with that, actually, interestingly enough, there was a study published in 2018 that showed that only 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy. 
So wow. that just shows you that most Americans are undernourished in some way, shape or form. And they're showing signs of metabolic disease, not just related to weight. Has the science changed in your opinion? I feel like it used to be restrict calories, low calorie foods, and that used to be used to equate that with maintaining healthy weight and health. But how has the science changed with maintaining healthy weight, with weight loss, in your opinion? Yeah, I think we've come a long way, you know, especially with defining obesity as a disease process and, and understanding that it's not just calories in, calories out, right? So the doctor, you know, you go see your doctor, and they're like, just, you know, stop eating or cut down what you're eating and go move around more. And we know that that's, it's not so simple, right? It's not so simple to lose weight that way. And it's more so, in my opinion, is where are your calories coming from? In general, for weight loss, weight loss, some form of calorie deficit is usually needed. However, I see patients coming in, they're following whatever diet app or nutrition tracking or calorie tracking app and they're keeping at 1100 calories a day and they're not losing weight. And, you know, we go into the nitty gritty. I'm, I'm not a dietitian, but I do a lot of nutrition counseling as a weight management specialist with my patients, along with my dietitians. And you start going into what are they eating? What are you, you know, what types of foods are you eating? Are you eating adequate, you know, protein? Are you getting fiber in? Are you getting good fats in? And we change around their macronutrient profile, changing the percentage of their calories coming in from carbohydrates, proteins, and fats and fiber. And sometimes the calories, total calories actually go up and they start losing weight. So it's really more on the quality of the foods that you're getting or that you're consuming that can really affect, you know, certain weight, weight hormones. So one is insulin. So, you know, what's going on with your sugar fluctuations during the day? What's your insulin? Insulin is the hormone that regulates blood sugar and it can promote weight if you're insulin resistant, right? If you're producing high levels of insulin. So sometimes just some simple macronutrient changes can really help with, with weight loss. So the whole idea of go on a super low calorie diet and that's how you're going to lose weight. I think the, the, that's certainly changing, which is good. It's so true. I mean, when we were all little, does, do any, do we remember talking about healthy fats as much as we do now? No. I don't hear about that at all. It was, it was all, all low fat, low fat, no <laughs> yes. fat, reduced and fat. Yeah. Exactly. And how much better do we all feel with some avocado, chickpeas, and olive oil in our lives? Oh my God. You yeah. know? So yeah. much. Well, and yeah. you were speaking a bit about uh, hormones and how that affects our weight. I just learned about this new hormone about hunger, and I'm going to probably say it wrong. Is it called ghrelin? And it's funny that you say new, because it is kind of new. It was just discovered in, I think it was 1999. So just in the last 20 years, it was discovered. So ghrelin I like to call it like our go hormone. It's our hunger hormone. It's released from cells in your stomach lining. We have an appetite control area in our brain and the hypothalamus. And that is where a lot of these regulatory hormones are stimulated at. So we have our appetite suppressing hormone, another hormone, which is leptin. And then there, there's many hormones, but these are just a couple of them. So leptin is one of them. So that's the one that tells your brain, okay, I'm full, no longer hungry stop eating. And then we have ghrelin. So that's a very popular new, new hormone in the last 20 years that we've discovered. And that's the one that stimulates about 30 minutes from 30 minutes to about an hour, two hours before you eat, or you start feeling those hunger pains, ghrelin starts going up. So ghrelin stimulates that appetite stimulating area in the brain. And a lot of times, you know, depending if you have other hormone fluctuations going on, like blood sugar issues or insulin resistance, or if you, you know, yo-yo dieted a lot in your life, um, you can have lots of fluctuations between your ghrelin and your leptin hormone. So that's what can cause a lot of hunger issues. And the other issue is that when anyone loses weight, especially if you're trying to lose weight from a, from a higher weight to much lower weight, the body's tendency is always to want to, to regain the weight. And one of, one of the hormones that goes up as you lose weight is ghrelin. Ghrelin starts telling your brain, I'm hungry. Let's start increasing those calories again. So it's Why? very complex. It's a very complex. Yeah. Why There's do ways that around to us? it. I know, right? It's not fair. There's. It doesn't mean you can't lose weight and keep it off, but understanding how these hormones work help us, you know, with the weight maintenance phase. Sometimes losing weight is not the hardest part. It's keeping it off for mm -hmm. things like this. The maintaining. So and I maintain. also feel like part of the reason that women hate weighing themselves so much is because depending on what time of month it is 
you could be five, eight pounds, at, like depending on your bloating, your PMS. And it's hard. It's hard to, to look at that. And it's frustrating and we don't understand it. Why as women does our weight fluctuate so much? Well, a lot of it, you, you already, you know, you stated there and, you know, we are in a constant hormone flux, right? Throughout the month, estrogen and progesterone, especially if you're, if, you know, if you're still menstruating, you know, that can certainly affect one tiredness, fatigue, bloating, you know, you, you, you start, you can accumulate more water, especially around the belly area as you're, you know, you're in that ovulatory phase, hunger levels sometimes can go up. Also during that time, cravings can go up. So maybe caloric intake may go up and weight may fluctuate a bit around that time of month. It's normal. Now I tell my female patients, I think tracking your weight is important because it helps you stay on some sort of track, but overly obsessing over the scale is also just not mentally it just it's just not good for you it, it like can derail your progress and sometimes i tell fem my female patients don't weigh yourself during your menstrual cycle week just just don't do it <laughs> I've, i have totally stopped weighing myself altogether. i'm just uh, like yeah I just don't even want to i have like a general idea of where i'm at but i'm like it fluctuates so much that i'm just I like know. It, it screws with my mind. Yeah, it's best. Honestly, it's um, if you're I think if you're trying to get to, you know, a certain weight or you want to try to lose weight and the scale is something that just stresses you out, then I tell my patients, just measure yourself just do you know, check your waist circumference, do your hip circumference. And I have patients that just don't want to get on the scale. Sometimes they get on the scale in our clinic and they close their eyes and we don't tell them, but we tell them what their measurements are reading and they're happy. They're happy with that. Why is that important to build muscle mass and have that as part of our routines? Different reasons. First of all, as we age, everyone, men and women, women more than men though, they tend, you lose lean body mass and your body's tendency is to want to gain fat. So that's why another reason why, you know, as we get older, it's easier to gain weight, but muscle mass building muscle is so important because it, one, it increases your metabolic rate, meaning the amount of calories that you burn naturally at rest. It serves as a reservoir for fuel, especially for sugar. It helps increase the amount of calories that we can burn in a day. Strength training in general helps also lower your percent body fat and keep your percent body fat at a more normal place. Cardio is so important for heart health, but I think most people, especially women, underestimate the power of strength training. And a lot of women I have, you know, especially postmenopausal women, it's just so hard, much harder sometimes for, again, going back to hormones, postmenopausal women sometimes struggle a lot more in, in losing weight. And a lot of it has to do with one, the yo-yo dieting that I mentioned before, really affecting your metabolic rate and having low muscle mass. You know, it's time to start really changing your exercise routine. Don't just run on the treadmill for 30 minutes, start lifting some weight, start build, you know, increase your metabolism that way. It can really have a big effect on, on, on inches and even the scale. So to that point, I'm interested to get your opinion on this because I was working with a doctor. We didn't really mesh well. I didn't really love her. And then I switched. I have a new doctor that I absolutely love, but I was kind of working with my weight. I have hypothyroid. I have a slow metabolism. And she was kind of of the mind of like, if you work out less then you can eat less you'll be less hungry, which is true, <laughs> which is true. But I was like, this is post COVID. My body needs to move more. Like I want to build muscle. I want to be more active. And I kind of dropped her like a hot potato. Oh my gosh. But this is a problem. It's not really her fault. I'll say. <laughs> it just made no sense. And I was like, I don't want to eat less and, and move less. Like this is not, this is not, but to that point, so right now I'm dealing with a little bit, I have tendonitis in my foot and I can't work out as much as I would like to, and I'm way less hungry. So it's not like it's, you know, you are less hungry when you yeah. work out less. So I'm just interested in your insight around this. I mean, yeah, obviously the more you move, you know, the more, you know, you're going to need to fuel your body, right? This is where the eat less, move more doesn't really work that well, right? Because your body gets hungry, ghrelin goes up, you need to fuel it. So uh, to, to work a way around that, it's again, increased. So we're in adjusting your macronutrients, right? So increasing your protein. Women in general, just don't eat enough protein at all. And protein is so powerful 
for weight loss, for energy, you know, for maintaining and losing weight. So for me on days where I'm more active, so let's say if I'm doing like a run and a strength train, I'm very hungry. So either I'll have some protein before, either in the form of a protein shake if I need something quick, or I'll have like a boiled egg or a can of tuna, or I'll add extra protein with my dinner. I make sure that I add those healthy fats in, I add more fiber. So really have quality, get your calories in from a quality source. And if you can get it mostly from protein, even better, because it's just going to help, you know, build your muscle mass as well. I'm happy to hear this because this is exactly what my new, my new doctor said. Yeah. That I okay. She was like, I want to- Give her a thumbs your- up then. <laughs> yes, let's give her a thumbs up. She was like, I actually want to make your body feel extremely safe when it's working out. So we need to make sure we're feeding it a lot of protein, yes. you know, before and after. So it doesn't feel too stressed. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm glad yeah. you say that. Do you have a suggestion or preference on like eating before or after working out? And what's your thought on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of data on fasted workouts. So if your body, if you, not everyone can do it because it does help, you know, you get, you pushes a little bit more of what's called a ketosis. So you go into more of a, a fat burn. Some people feel more energy actually, you know, working out in a fasted state. So you kind of have to listen to your body when it comes to that. If you're feeling sluggish, if you're having a hard time getting through your workout because you didn't eat before, then maybe having a protein serving before, right? So maybe having that shake or having a boiled egg or something protein dense, um, some chickpeas, something, some nuts or seeds beforehand well, can help you feel. So for that, I think you really just have to listen to how your body feels when you're exercising. It's so, like you said, it's so individual because like I can totally do the fast workout. Alex cannot. She has to eat. So yeah, I try. I try. I tried intermittent fasting. And what I found is I love the night part, the not eating after six or seven. It makes me feel great in the morning, but I need breakfast. I have breakfast. Exactly. Exactly. And I learned this and I tried to do it and I would do a fasted workout. And afterwards I was so hungry that I was mad. I was like pulling off my (laughs) husband's head. I've eaten like three lunches and I was like, this is not, this is making me feel like a crazy person. Like I cannot, I'm going to have a hard boiled egg and half an avocado for God's sake. Like it's not going to kill me. And like, you know, and and I, I just can't, but yeah, Tina wakes up not hungry at all. Yeah. And it's so, again, everybody's so different, but it's so great that you can keep your eating window. So intermittent fasting is a you know, there's a lot of data behind this, a lot of controversy too. You'll Mm -hmm. go on med Twitter and some doctors agree with it. Some doctors don't. I, again, it's very individualized for everybody. I think eating windows can really help with maintaining weight and weight loss and helping with cravings too and hunger, whether you keep it at a short window or a longer window, I think definitely stop eating, you know, two to three hours before bedtime can really help with gut you know, inflammation, you know, staying at a steady weight, reducing hunger cravings, whether at night or in the morning. So intermittent fasting, whatever way you do it, either earlier in the day or later in the day, I think it's a great tool. And I know that you're also really focused on on preventing disease. Mm -hmm. And it seems like not a lot of doctors are interested in like the why of some why we're feeling the way they are we are it's all about the symptoms let's treat the symptom let's prescribe a medication why do you think that is i think it's a lot of it has to do with when you trained you know when did, did you become a physician i think newer age um, doctors and newer age science is more towards the preventive medicine portion of things the other big issue and this is what you know what i struggled with when i was doing general primary care now my focus is more weight management and and managing metabolic diseases, but the time, some doctors, depending on what kind of clinic you went to, you know, there's just was, you know, you have 10, 15 minutes. You don't really have time to go through such detail with patients in terms of preventing disease, you know, going into the more nutrition and lifestyle and what stressors, you know, all the things that I go through with my patients and my visits, because I now am lucky enough to have longer visit times with my patients. It's hard. So I'm getting referred, you know, I'm getting referred patients from primary care because they don't have the time to do it and their patient volume and their patient load is just too high. So I think it really, unfortunately, it comes down to that and how our health system is set up, you know, where it's, it's volume, especially if you work for a, for a hospital system, they look at your numbers. So you need to see 25, 30 patients a day and you just don't have the time, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it's really tough. hard that it's set up like that to only yeah. have that short window, you know, and it's not the doctor's yeah. fault. It's kind of the structure. 
it's the structure yeah. exactly exactly so and, and and you know a lot of doctors are burnt out and they just and sometimes it's just like you know I'm, I'm just not gonna I don't care at this point. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, so, and I'm not saying all, not every doctor is no, like no, that, no. but I think the struggles are there. And I think most primary care doctors, you know, especially if they're working for a big hospital system may, you know, will probably share that same sentiment that it's just, it's challenging with, mm-hmm. with time. Can you give us an example of a success story where you helped someone reverse their diabetes or get more metabolically healthy? Sure. I'm actually working with a couple of patients um, with diabetes now, well, I work with a lot of patients with diabetes, but, um, a couple that are on insulin and they've been able to get off of it, get wow. off of insulin. type two diabetes, type one diabetes, you know, or is an insulin dependent diabetes, you know, just with nutrition and lifestyle, nutrition and lifestyle, you know, adjusting their macronutrient profile on 50 units of insulin. So insulin is, um, just for a little background, insulin is what you inject is the hormone that regulates blood sugar. When you have uncontrolled diabetes or when your diabetes has been, you know, you've had diabetes for a long time and you're very insulin resistant, meaning the insulin that your own body makes is not um, working efficiently. Now you need to inject insulin to control your blood sugars, right? But the problem with insulin is that it's, it's a weight promoting hormone when you're injecting, when you're, when you're either producing a lot of it in your body and now injecting it because the role of insulin is to take sugar and store it, right? It takes it to bot- the area of the body that needed for fuel, but it's mostly being stored as fat in different areas of the body. So this is where insulin dependent patients with diabetes, type two diabetes really struggle with their weight. So, and a lot of it comes down to, you know, nutrition and lifestyle, eating the right foods, doing the right exercises, moving. Um, so I've had, I'm actually have several patients most recently in this last week where there, there had one patient who was, I think on 70 units of insulin, he's down to 12 units and we're almost there to, to get him off, wow. off his insulin. And, and he's just feeling, this is actually a patient that has sleep, a lot of sleep issues, narcolepsy, obstructive sleep apnea, and even the narcolepsy, which is like the severe daytime sleepiness has improved just wow. with normalizing his blood sugars and losing weight. And typically with patients like that, what's the time frame? What's the turnaround for seeing results? Again, it's very individualized. It depends on, you know, how strong they want to go in lifestyle changes. I mean, I've had, you know, this last week, I started working with one patient two weeks ago and every two days he's calling me like, my sugar's dropping, my sugar's dropping. I need to wean off insulin. It can take someone a couple of weeks. It can take someone, uh, you know, six months to a year. So it's, 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 it's really different, like how your body responds. Do you personally have any food sensitivities or allergies? And like, what do you typically eat in a day? What's- I'm not perfect, number one. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> um, I don't really have, thank God, knock on wood, I don't really have too many food sensitivities. I can't eat very high, like greasy high fat, spicy foods. It doesn't, it triggers some um, gastritis for me on a typical day, on a good day. I have a cup of coffee in the morning, almond milk. I start my day with protein. So I'll have like a yogurt or two hard boiled eggs in the morning. Um, I keep an eating window. So I would stop eating, you know, by seven, eight o'clock. I pack my lunch, which I don't always do because I'm on the go. <laughs> I have a toddler. You know, I always try to include greens. I always try to include two to three servings of protein a day. I always try to include those healthy two to three servings of healthy fats, whether it's like a reduced or full fat yogurt or an avocado, olive oil. My go-to snack is almonds. So I have a handful of almonds. And then I have a husband that loves to cook, so I don't have to prepare dinner. He does pretty well. So he always has a protein and a vegetable for dinner. Nice. So that's a good day for me. A bad day is when I don't eat. <laughs> and I skip meals and I'm overly hungry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's me. I, I have a tendency to do that. <laughs> you also have an insane schedule and a toddler. So I mean, yeah, I know, I know. So sometimes, you know, it's just, it's hard. And that's where meal planning, sometimes just prepping. So on like good weeks, and I tell my patients this, it's just like plan your meals on Sundays. You know, if your week starts on Monday, you know, get your containers going, pack your lunch for the week. And it's going to take, eliminate that one stressor that you have to worry about during the week and it's going to eliminate you making potentially a bad food choice, you know, going to somewhere fast food or skipping, you know, sometimes skipping a meal is not, 
ideal either because it can create a, you know a lot of hunger and then bad food choices later in the day yeah, I get like and- such decision fatigue trying to figure out what to eat so if I plan it out it's like great I don't have to think about that so in terms of having a treat like a special night a celebration I know that I would rather have a martini than a piece of chocolate cake any day or a glass of wine like that's what I would rather have than sugar any day so can you give us some tips are there ways to have a cocktail or wine in a healthy way that doesn't spike our blood sugar too much that won't get us so off track I'll start off by saying I love wine and I do like to drink. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's lots of health benefits to wine as well. But I think especially for women, moderation is still key. You know, technically women should be having not more than one alcoholic drink a day. Uh, I try to tell all my patients, but especially my female patients, try to limit it during the week. You know, try to just stay hydrated. You know, even if it's like Monday through Wednesday or Monday through Thursday, try to get a higher quality, you know, a good quality wine, you know, red wines, um, a good dry white wine that's a little bit lower in sugar. If you're having a mixed drink, avoid those high sugary like spritzers or try not to add juice and regular soda. Um, stay hydrated too. So if, you, if you're going out to dinner, you know, you're going to go have a couple of drinks, have one drink and then follow it with a glass of water afterwards, because it's really that dehydration that's going to cause, can potentially cause that hangover or, you know, the increased cravings later that night or the next day. Do you have any tips for someone that is struggling with a sluggish metabolism um, and wants to speed it up? Yeah, I think it's one, you know, sluggish metabolism. That's a good term because their metabolism probably is not sluggish it's probably just you know their energy levels are low because they may not be sleeping well or they not be eating the right foods so i think really identifying what are what are the barriers right you know what what are you what are you struggling with the most what might be affecting that sluggish feeling right you, you know chances are you're probably not sleeping well is there stress going on in your life and then target that first and fix that. You know, a lot of times sleep is so important. And a lot of times patients are coming in, you know, not feeling well, not even, you know, weight or not weight related. Even when I was in primary care, anxiety, depression, um, hunger throughout the day. And one of the first questions I ask is, you know, how is your sleep? How many hours a night are you sleeping? So I think identifying what the first, what's the biggest barrier throughout their day and then targeting that and, and, and starting to fix that. Do you personally have any sort of favorite wellness self-care thing that you do besides the sleep, the nutrition, the working out? Is there a facial in your life that makes you feel good? A massage, a, yo- a meditation practice? Is there any sort of extra thing you do for yourself that just makes you feel great? I think really, so skincare is a big big one. And I know you, you ladies love and know all the best (laughs) tips about skincare. So I don't even know if I know, will know as much as you, but that's always, that makes me feel good. You know, doing something um, outside of like your normal routine. So for me, it's like getting my nails done every three weeks, you know, getting that pedicure done, using my favorite lotion at night, using my serums in the morning. So those types of things always help me. One thing that I miss from, I guess, pre-pandemic, I haven't yet gone back to any group fitness classes, but, you know, participating in yoga or Pilates, you know, finding something that you really enjoy. I'm the same way. I love the group classes. I just, the community feel. I feel like you work harder. I think that's more yeah. fun. You can actually put your phone down. I know. You know. It's like in a locker. You can't be like, oh, in the middle of workout in your living room, be like, oh, wait, did I just get a phone call? And then the workout's done, you know? Do you have any advice for women who struggle with their body image? It's a big issue for, for many, many women. And I think it's taking a step back and just really looking at the, the female body, right? What are, what is the, the female body capable of doing and why, why was it created? Right. You know, we were meant to carry childs, right? We were meant to feed a child, whether you decide to have children or not. Um, women were meant to be curvy. You know, we are, we have a higher body fat percentage than men for a reason. So sometimes taking a step back and just loving the female body in general and just being so mindful of that and being aware of that 
can sometimes help somebody's body image too. But I think for somebody that's really struggling and that's really struggling to make progress is seek out help, you know, seek out help, find a doctor that you trust, find your friend that you trust or your family. And the great online resource too for weight management is the Obesity Medicine Association. So if you go to Obesity Medicine Association, I think it's dot org, there's a find a physician there. So finding a, a doctor that focuses on weight management that knows how to manage, you know, body image disorders and help with the underlying depression, anxiety might be the right route. You know, so many people are just scared to ask for help, but as many as, you know, sometimes women and especially women and men struggling with their weight are scared to go to their doctor. I think it's becoming a lot more, you know, there's a lot more doctors specializing in obesity medicine. So, the, you know, there's a, and metabolic health and lifestyle medicine and functional medicine. So there's like so many resources out there that, you know, you can find somebody. And if there's someone listening, who's maybe stuck in some bad patterns right now, who, especially after the pandemic, you know, whose life has changed, maybe they're drinking every single night, maybe they're skipping lunch, maybe they're ordering out every single night because, you know, whatever it is, and they want to make a change and they want to get healthier, it's really overwhelming. So mm -hmm. can you give a few, two to three just actionable steps that someone can do at home this week just to start? So I tell a lot of my patients this because it can be overwhelming, right? There's maybe a lot of different reasons why they may be struggling. So I usually tell patients to write it out. Start off just the old fashioned way, get a pen and paper or a whiteboard and start writing out you know, what are the biggest things that I'm struggling with? You know, what are the roadblocks that are causing me to be inconsistent, right? Is it the meal prepping? Is it that I have to be up at five o'clock in the morning to be at work? Is it my child's care issue? Is it my husband? Is it my boyfriend? Is it the people around me? Is it that, you know, I just don't have time to prep my meals and then I make bad food decisions. So write it out, you know, um, so that you can really visualize what is it that I need to work on? And if it's a lot of things, pick one, you know, just pick one small change every week. So if it's that I need to go to bed 30 minutes earlier so that I have 30 minutes of extra sleep so that I'm not as tired, whether it's, you know, you're going out for lunch or dinner, you're not prepping any of your meals. Let's start with two days a week. Let's prep two days a week, my lunch. If I'm not moving enough, or you feel, or you, it's really hard to fit exercise. These are just examples, but if you are having a hard time to fit exercise in something simple, like if you're in the city or in a, ma a major city, I'm going to walk, get out of my train stop or bus stop, a stop earlier, or I'm going to use the stairs to go up to get to my office. So just make start small. You know, some people can make lots of big changes all at once. And that's great. But if you're finding that making a lot of big changes at once becomes overwhelming, you could do it for a week or two and then you derail, then just start small. Start with small steps every week. And really those small baby steps is what you can build for um, a lot more long-term success. And I have patients that do really, really well where we set you know, a small goal every month. They achieve that goal. Sometimes they surpass it. Sometimes they just meet that goal and then we, we adjust it at the next visit. I'm totally the person that's like, okay, I'm going to change my life today. And like everything, and then I burn out within the first week and then yeah. I'm like, well, screw it. I'm going to, I'm not going to do screw it at all. It. But if just like one thing, this has been so enlightening. We've got a few more like rapid fire questions, like sure. funny questions for you. What are two beauty products that you just mm. cannot live without? Because your skin is glowing. <laughs> wing you have the most beautiful screen. skin. Oh. And your oh. hair is like flowing like a beautiful mermaid. Like you yes. are so I love gorgeous. you, Alex. I'm so Can I be on your podcast every week? <laughs> every week. Every, you are a land mermaid. Yes. <laughs> One thing that I've been using since I was 15, and I told this to the Ulta lady yesterday, is good old Clinique. But I've been using their face powder. It's their sheer matte face powder. And it's a really light powder. I use every day as just like my base powder to go to work to go to school when I was in school, literally since I was 15. My mom bought it for me when I was 15. And I'm still using it 15 plus years If it later. ain't broke, so you know, if it ain't broke. <laughs> yeah. It just works. Yeah. It's working for you. Yeah, yeah. So the other one is I use this um, Hydro Boost, really cheap. It's like thirteen dollars. Neutrogena. Do you do you use that? We They're love it. Ultra? We love it. Oh Tina used it. So when we were roommates, 
Tina was using it way back yeah. when she was like, you have to try this. She's like, your skin is just going to feel so plump. And I started using it too. It's a great, that's a great one. It's my next purchase. Cause I'm almost out of my, my day cream yeah. and I'm like, Nope, I'm going back to the hydro boost. I think those are probably my two and a vitamin C serum. I recommend all women to use a vitamin C serum. So I'm using so the Murad right now. You're using the Murad vitamin C. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a little bit more pricey, but I think splurging on a couple of few, you know, face products also makes you feel good inside. So yeah, and you can mix it that. <laughs> That's my little really splurge. high quality face serum, but then you don't need to spend a million dollars on your, your cleanser, you know, cause exactly. it's just, you're taking it off your face, but you know, if you can mix and match with yeah. different things and it, it's, we love that. Yeah. yeah we yeah. talk about that a lot, the mixing high and low and also vitamin C is really expensive. Mm -hmm. So that's the place to splurge. And then you can get like a $5 or something from the ordinary or right. mix it with a drugstore. Like that's kind of the way to do it. I love that. Yeah. So is there a woman that you can think of who's really inspiring to you that you think that we should know about, that we might not know, that we should follow her, we should know about her? Queen Latifah. Yes. When we're talking about the obesity movement and women's image and body image, I don't know if you're aware, but Queen Latifah has actually recently starter started a bigger than me movement. So if you Google bigger than me, I think it's the website. It's bigger. It's bigger than .com. I just searched it here, bigger than .com. And she is one of the leads of this movement. And I think they have a hashtag as well. And she is talking a lot about weight bias. She's got a ton of videos online um, about weight bias and body image. And she talks a lot about how it has affected her to also get to a healthier weight. So I think a lot of women can really um, relate to her. So if you can get her on your podcast. Oh my God. <laughs> I have loved Queen Latifah. Please have me as a third co-host. Oh my, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. That's such a good resource. I had no idea that's what she yeah, was up to. And yeah. I so love I, her. I recently learned this a couple of weeks ago and I've been, you know, I quickly searched her and started following her and the Bigger Than Me movement. And I think it's really really wonderful that that she's doing that and then I think female doctors and female scientists unfortunately they just don't promote themselves as much as they should but there's another doctor um she's actually one of the science directors at Mass the weight management center at Mass General Dr. Fatima Cody and she also and she's live on Instagram and on Twitter she's pretty active on, on those two platforms and she really promotes a lot about weight bat bias, eliminating weight bias, weight stigma, health disparities, especially during the COVID pandemic. Um, so she's a real pretty amazing, she's published a lot. She's a pretty big speaker in the medical world, especially in the obesity medicine world. So she would be someone to, to also consider following on Instagram and social media. Speaking yeah. of following on social media, where can we find you and where can we follow you? Yeah, so I have an Instagram that I try to be as active as I can. Sometimes I'm boring, but I'm trying to be better about it. I'm on Instagram at the Metabolic Doc. I'm on Twitter, also Dr. Stephanie Page. You can find me on LinkedIn um, as well. So I try, I try to post at least once or twice a week, and I'm trying to be more engaging for my patients and my followers. So you can find me there. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing yeah, all of this. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. 